you get your Bibles out, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11 is where we're going to be studying from tonight. Uh, good to see so many of you here tonight. Many of you have been out of town and you're back, and it's great to have you again. Um, we've been studying through Isaiah. We've been learning a lot about uh, God's promises and God's judgment against those who are wicked. Uh, we've seen that Israel is uh, under condemnation. They're constantly being wicked. We've seen Judah also is condemned as the king of, of, Israel, of Judah is Ahaz, and he refused to trust in God. Instead, he pursued trusting in Assyria. And God has been giving us a message over and over again, as Isaiah has been providing it, that he's going to bring judgment on those who are wicked. His anger is not going to turn away as they receive judgment, but he's going to continue and press in with his anger. And then we have seen little remnants of hope. Remnant is the key word there. That there is a remnant that God is going to save. That he's going to bring through the fire of all the judgments that he is preparing. And that he's going to bring them into a time of hope. And they're going to learn to, uh, to trust in God like they never have before. They've always trusted in themselves. They've trusted in men. And God is going to bring them through this trial, and out the other side, going to help them to see the truth. So we open up our Bibles to Hebrews 11 and 12, and we're going to study that tonight. Really, that message of hope is, is, is found here. This is kind of the end of the section, uh, even though there is more. We're going, to, we're going to talk next week. We're going to cover a big, actually two weeks, because we got singing next week. We're going to cover a big section of Isaiah and make some good progress before we take a break for a little while. Um, and that's also hope, but it's odd. Hope is not like this. Um, but today we're going to see this message of hope in, the, in that whenever people have gone through devastation, whenever people have gone through destruction, whenever they've gone through a trial, uh, that God is able to take that destruct, destruction and bring out of it something amazing, uh, something full of hope, full of joy. Uh, and if you could just imagine a forest being completely leveled by fire, and just devastated, and, and you look at it, and all the, the houses amidst it, or they're just all ruined and destroyed, and, and there's nothing there. It was this once lush forest full of fruit and vegetation, and it's just decimated. And you might look at that and think, where do we go from here? Well, there's nothing left. And yet, as we read today, we're going to see God is able to take that, that hopeless place, and he's able to create something amazing. Okay, let's look at this first, starting in uh, chapter 11. Notice verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Well, first of all, notice here, there's this picture of a stump. Okay, and the idea of a stump is that it was once this huge, great tree and it has been cut down, or it, is, it has been burned up, and it no longer is there. It's no longer this great big tree. It's nothing. And that's a picture, he says, of the Davidic dynasty. Okay, And the, and the picture is that there's going to be this little bitty shoot that comes up out of this stump. And it's this, this small little stem, this small little sprig coming up and it gives you this kind of question this kind of wondering can God use something so small to create something great again and that's that's just a little bit of hope that he's bringing out here because he's he's hoping he's going to raise up the Davidic dynasty and at this time Isaiah is prophesying the Davidic dynasty is still in place Ahaz is king uh, and he is the one who has been an idolatrous king, an evil king, a wicked king. And he's ruled over Judah, but Judah is small, and it's getting smaller. And Assyria is going to come, and they're going to destroy much of it. And it's nowhere near the glory days of King David. And, and eventually, we're going to see the Babylonians come in and just wipe it out. It's going to be completely destroyed. And God is saying, after that stump has been laid bare... I'm going to bring a shoot from the stump of Jesse. In other words, Jesse being David's father, uh, God is going to bring a, a new king, a new hope for the Davidic dynasty that's going to rise up and it's going to provide this wonderful place. Listen to this, verse 2. 
It says, and the spirit of Lord of the Lord shall rest upon him. So the shoot is a him. It's a descendant of David. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of of his loins. Notice that God is foretelling a, a new line from David that is going to rise up and he's going to be given this spirit of the Lord and he's going to, to make judgments that are good and right and true. And he's going to make it to where righteousness reigns on the earth. That everyone is pursuing what is righteous and what is good. And he's going to make the right judgments so that those who do wicked will receive what they deserve. They will receive judgment for that. They will be struck for that. And those who are truly righteous will be seen. And those who are fake righteous will be known. Notice he says he's not going to judge based on what it looks like. He's not going to judge based on what it sounds like. He doesn't care about your, your outer appearance, your show, your ability to a, appear as though you're righteous. He doesn't care about that. He looks through all of that. He has penetrating sight to see to the heart of the man and to know who is truly God-loving and who is truly self-loving. And so God is foretelling a time when he's going to raise up a Davidic king, and this king is going to be the king. He's going to have the best reign possible, the best reign imaginable. The problem with the, the human kings that we've seen throughout history is that they can't make these kinds of judgments. Their best efforts fall short. They can't look past what their eyes see and what their ears hear. And they can't make judgments in equity, in, in equality. They have biases. And he says this king is going to do that. This king's going to rule in righteousness. So a beautiful picture, and we know who it's pointing to, don't we? We know who the Davidic king's going to be. You continue verses 6 through 10, notice what else this king's going to do. It says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters Cover the sea. You see what this king is going to do is establish a kingdom where there is peace and love, where there is righteousness throughout the land. And, and he portrays it metaphorically, talking about people as though they are lions and lambs, as though they are snakes, as though they are wolves, as though they are bears. And he says they're all going to come together and no one is going to hurt one another. No one's going to destroy one another. They're not going to seek that in all of my holy mountain. You know, this, this Jerusalem is going to be a place of peace. It's going to be a place of security. Everybody's going to learn and understand and know who God is, and they're going to follow after his ways. They're going to be like their king. And they're going to show love and compassion and mercy towards one another. And I love this. A child will lead them. You see, this, this little child leading is, uh, is so much. So much of all of this is just so New Testament that the least will be the greatest in the kingdom. And that's ex exactly what is being pointed to. This is a picture of the kingdom of God. And it's a picture that is beyond their understanding. As they're reading this and they're learning this, they don't grasp it. But us, in the New Testament, with the understanding of the New Testament, we can grasp it and we can understand 
this is what God has provided for us. And the message as we study this is that God is able to bring life from death. This nation is empty, it is wicked, it is on the verge of collapsing, it will be destroyed. But God will bring out of it something that has never been experienced in the history of mankind. A kingdom unlike any other kingdom. As you read that, don't you just get the feeling that nothing is ever really hopeless? Nothing's hopeless. I mean, here's a kingdom that, that, that is wicked as can be. I mean, we read through the Old Testament, we're just rolling our eyes at Israel, right? How wicked can they be? Why are they always wicked? Why are they always pursuing all these things? They're never going to change. They're never going to come around. You know, life's never going to be better. But it will. Because God is going to make it that way. That God can take something that is so broken and so useless, and he can redeem it. He can buy it back, and he can make it into something that is wonderful, amazing, and never before seen on the earth. So this is just a beautiful picture of hope in these first ten verses. Verse 10 says, In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. This is a picture of Jesus bringing hope to all the nations, standing as a signal for them, a sign for them to know that our God lives and our God reigns and he can provide everything that you need. We're going to see this continue and this same idea of hopefulness as we go through the rest of this chapter and the next. Look at verses 11 through 16. Uh, I'll just read 11 and 12. It says, In that day the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people. From Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations, and he will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. It's a beautiful picture of hope for the people that he's going to bring them back. Notice he he says there's going to be a second remnant. He's going to extend his hand to a second remnant. Now, why does he say that? We heard about a a remnant earlier. He said there was going to be a remnant after the Assyrian invasion, after the Babylonian invasion, there's going to be a remnant. He's going to bring his people back. He's going to bring Israel. He's going to bring uh, Judah back, and he's going to provide for them. So that first remnant returned in 539 B.C. We read about that as we go throughout the rest of the Old Testament. But now there's a second remnant, and he says they are going to come from far and wide, all across the globe, and they're all going to come to the the land that God has redeemed and that God has provided for, and they're going to be a part of God's people. What is he trying to say in this whole section? Well, he's giving this point that God doesn't forget about the outcast. He's not forgetting about those who are outliers. His kingdom will reach out for all of those who are far away to be able to come in and to be a part of this kingdom and receive all the promises and all the blessings. Notice, God has already redeemed a a remnant earlier and God has already uh, got all these people together again and yet he's not done. He has more to do. He goes even further beyond where he went the last time. He is expanding his search to find more outcasts and bring them in. And overall, I think the picture here is that God is expanding his kingdom to include all who will come to him in humility. God doesn't look at someone and say they're too far away. He is sending for everyone everywhere, and he's trying to bring them in. So the neighbor next door who, uh, you know, looks like they're righteous and they're doing all the right things and everything, yeah, the gospel's for them. But even the one who's next door that is nothing like what you would ever picture a righteous person to be, God is looking for them. God is trying to bring in the outcasts. He's trying to bring in the people who are far away from him. And he's trying to redeem them and provide for them the hope. Verse 16 says, there will be a highway from Assyria, for the remnant that remains of this people, 
as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. This is a picture of God's going to walk them back. Wherever they are, he's going to make a highway and he's going to pave it for them so that they can find their way back to him. And then, so that's another picture of hope. But then chapter 12 is just amazing. Okay. When we come to chapter 12, uh, the words of chapter 12 are really encouraging and we sing songs about these words. So let's read through this, verses 1 through 6. They will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Notice here, first of all, he says, he's giving thanks because God's anger has turned away. Earlier we saw him saying, my, my anger has not turned away. My arm is still outstretched. You know, I'm still going to strike you. I'm still going to strike you. I'm still going to strike you. And now he says, finally, in this day, the anger is turning away. And the anger has been turned into comfort. God is providing comfort for his people. Well, what's changed? What's changed is the heart of the people. They have come to recognize, they've come to realize that they are wicked. And they are humbled before God. And now pursuing God's forgiveness. Notice, they'll say in that day, God is my salvation. And I will trust and not be afraid. He is my strength and my song. Yeah, that's, a, that's a complete and utter uh, opposite idea and attitude from what we saw earlier. With Ahaz wanting to trust Assyria and refusing to trust in God. With the people themselves. And in every instance, they're constantly trusting in themselves. They're pursuing wickedness to try to find fulfillment, to try to find salvation, to try to find satisfaction. And you see that there's a big shift in the attitude in the heart of the individuals that they would now say, God is my salvation. I didn't save myself. I can't save myself. I need God to help me. And they'll pursue God knowing and believing that he is good, that he can provide the salvation that they're looking for. Notice he says they're going to trust him. Earlier, he said the remnant's going to rely on God. They're not going to rely on men. And this is the same picture. They're going to trust God and not be afraid. He's going to be their strength. He's going to be their song. You see how this, this remnant, this second remnant, is just fully invested and devoted to God. It's all been transformed from what was there earlier. And then there's this picture. With joy you will draw water from the wells of of salvation. That's, that's as New Testament as it gets. You think of Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman, and he says, if, if you'd asked me, I'd have given you living water. You'd never be thirsty again. Well, here is that the promise. Isaiah and God is, is revealing a promise. With joy, you'll draw waters from the wells of salvation. This picture of salvation will be made available for everyone who's willing to go and draw water from those wells. And as a result, they're going to be singing for joy over all that God is doing for them. Notice also, as you go through the last part, the last half of this chapter, he transitions from talking about what God has done to talking about what he will do. There's a response to grace. The first part is all about God's grace. God is the God of my salvation. I'm going to sing for joy and trust in him because he has given me all this. And then it says... Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds. This is like a proclamation of God's goodness to everyone and telling everyone, sing out. Give thanks to God. You who have experienced the salvation of God, 
see that he's done gloriously and sing and rejoice and let him be known in all the earth. Speak to others about how good God is. Let them know that there's, there's a God who loves, a God who cares for you, a God who seeks the outcast, a God who heals the broken, who brings life from death. Let them know, speak it, sing it, rejoice over it, because he is great, and you know it. See, the transition from grace to evangelism. We're not saved to be saved. We're saved to share salvation. Jesus said this in John chapter 7, that those who come to me and eat and come to me and drink will become will have a wellspring of life coming out of them and there'll be wells for other people of salvation. That's the intention. That's the goal. The wells of salvation are those who've been saved. The water that we receive, it, it gives us life and it causes us to produce that water and share it with other people. And that is overall the desire of God. Okay? So this is a beautiful picture of hope that we find in chapters 11 and 12. And that picture of drawing from the well is really, really interesting and really, really important. Let's think about that for just a second, just a little bit more. You know, that idea of being thirsty uh, and, and desiring satisfaction is not a new idea, but it's an idea that we find throughout the Old Testament. Notice Ecclesiastes is just full of it. Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that God has put eternity into man's heart. We have this inner desire, this inner thirst, this inner longing. And there's nothing that we can find on this earth that will fill it. We talked a little bit about that this morning with all our riches. We're trying to squeeze eternity out of all those riches. We've got an eternity-sized hole inside of us, and we're throwing possessions in it, thinking that that will fill it. But God is promising fulfillment and filling in Jesus. We need this. We need to drink from the well of salvation and never thirst again. And so what are we going to do? First of all, acknowledge you're thirsty. Recognize that. Understand I'm thirsting for fulfillment. I'm thirsting for filling. I feel empty inside. Okay, great. Now, where are you going to find fulfillment that lasts? You can pursue all these other things. But God is providing us with the ultimate fulfillment. Jesus, on that day, saying, come to me if you're thirsty, and I'll give you living water, is a picture of him being the source. We need to go to him and find the salvation, find the fulfillment that we're desiring in his words. You know, really the problem that we have is we just have the world constantly throwing things at us advertising to us, selling, selling us things that will fill the hole that will never fill the hole, and we buy into it. We can't do that. We have to trust that the rich fulfillment comes through Jesus. We have to have faith that if we keep drawing from this well, that that hole will be filled. Even if it doesn't feel like it right now, Maybe because you're not very experienced in studying, you're not very knowledgeable about all that Jesus has done and all that he's revealed. But as you study, man, it does, it fills. It fills completely. It brings joy to your hearts that nothing in this world can compare to. So we've had multiple studies going on and meetups and all of that. I mean, I'm just enjoying eating it up, and I'm just wishing everybody was doing this. I mean, I, I wish you were constantly in Bible studies, talking to people about spiritual things and just eating from the word and just making the time for that because it's, it's good. Taste it. See it. It's good. It fills you way more than the binging on Netflix stuff. It fills you, I promise. And those relationships that we develop with one another that are based on faith help us to, to strengthen the resolve to keep drinking and not just take a sip and then go away and forget that that was good we got to drink deeply we got to drink a lot don't get that bucket full and then take a sip and set it down 
drink it up and don't stop drinking it. We should be Bible scholars. We should seek to be knowledgeable in the scriptures and understanding about who God is. We should be full of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. You know, it's just where it should just be filling us and coming out of us so that we share it with other people. We of all people should be the people of the word. We should be the people who know the word inside and out, who are constantly seeking to know more and who can share it with others. And if you're feeling empty week after week after week, are you filling yourself with God? That's what we need. That's what we need. As we, as we study this, you see God is setting us up with this wonderful king and this wonderful kingdom. He's willing to take all that is broken. He's willing to heal it. He's willing to bring those who are outcast in. He's willing to take what is dead and bring it to life and, and refresh and, and nourish us and restore us by giving us Jesus. We need to take advantage of the blessing that we've received. Jesus represents God's power to fulfill all of these promises. This is 700 years before Jesus ever comes. Okay, God can fulfill all of his promises. And he does. And God can fill us. Just like he says he can. Take hold of the eternal things. Set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. And find that, that God is there. He loves you and he cares for you. You're not insignificant to God. God sees you and God can provide for you the eternal hope of glory. Hopefully today as you read this and you see these wonderful truths in the Old Testament, these prophecies that God has fulfilled in Jesus, you can leave here singing joyfully, knowing God is almighty and powerful, and he loves you, and he cares for you, and he's provided you with everything you need. And I hope you renew your efforts to study his word, and to go dive deep into the things he's revealed to us. If you're here tonight, and you're not a child of God, this is your opportunity to come forward and to accept his grace, but I think most everybody here has, has accepted the grace of God. Uh, if you're here tonight and you're not really living for God, you're not being faithful, uh, you're not pursuing his kingdom, you're not pursuing his grace, you're not pursuing fulfillment through Christ, uh, why not? Has the world gotten its hold on you? Are you like the soil that's surrounded by thorns and it's all being choked out of you to where there's no fruit? God has given you everything you need to be fruitful. Please don't continue that way. Please change. And let us know if we can help you in any way. Please come as we stand. As we sing.